Okay, so hi everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, again, we're just giving it a, a few minutes to get everybody settled, but I think we've got critical mass right now, so we'll probably get rolling. I just want to thank everybody so much for being here today. I'm Tanya Pobeda, and I'm a PhD candidate at York and X University in Toronto. My pronouns are she, her, there, and I'm studying board games as part of my doctoral work. And I'm writing my PhD dissertation about racial and gender representation in board gaming. And first, we really want to do a land acknowledgement. We are, to, we are gathered together on Zoom, and Zoom has erected its headquarters in San Jose, California. This is the traditional territory of the Mue Akma Ohlone tribal nation. Current members of this nation are direct descendants of the many missionized tribal groups from across the region. All of us who are here on Zoom are deeply indebted to the Mue Akma Ohlone people, as the lands and waters they continue to seward now support the people, pipelines, and technologies that carry our breaths, images, and words across vast distances to others. And this land acknowledgement is used with permission by its author, Dr. Jill Carter. Thank you so much, Dr. Carter. X University and York University are located in Toronto. The area known as Takaronto is caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat and the Métis. This territory is subject of the Dish with One, soon, uh, one Spoon Wampum Belt Coven Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. I'm here today with my academic colleagues, Dr. Sarah Stang, a feminist game scholar who researches gender representation in digital and analog games, and Erica Chung, a cultural analyst who looks at fandoms and community building with a special focus on comic books and diversity. I want to just share some really quick rules of engagement and our agenda for today. First, we want to create a welcoming space for all people. We are, we are agreeing to learn from, teach, include, mentor, respect, and celebrate others. We want to encourage all forms of respectful and collegial dialogue, debate, and discussion. I believe this meeting of the minds today makes our community stronger and more vibrant. We're going to be talking about how sharing and open dialogue is what makes for strong bonds interpersonally and culturally, both online and in our physical environments. We reserve the right to moderate questions that are not relevant or demean, dehumanize, or hurt others. And now the moment you're all waiting for. It is with such pride and deep admiration that I introduce Mandy Hutchison today. Mandy runs the channel to die for games and is a member of the Dice Tower team where she does both video reviews and live game playthroughs. On the Dice Tower, she vlogs and co-hosts the digital show Aptastic and co-hosts the, uh, the Dice Tower podcast bi-weekly with Suzanne Sheldon. She also shares a Twitch channel, uh, Salt and Sass Games with Suzanne. Mandy is a teacher who uses gamification strategies in the classroom, especially when discussing and conveying information on important topics such as harassment prevention, mental health awareness, inclusion, accessibility, and diversity. And we cannot forget her affinity for pinup fashion and her easily recognizable and gorgeous hair color. And it's with equal excitement and joy that we also introduce Eric M. Lang. Eric Lang is a game designer, and that really feels like the understatement of the century. He's a game designer's game designer. His design credits are extensive with board game hits like Blood Rage, Dice Masters, Star Wars the Card Game, Arcadia. He's also got this great new game called Disney Sidekicks, a cooperative game where you rescue your favorite heroes from Disney from its nastiest villains. Uh, Eric began his career as a playtester for FASA, Fredonian Aeronautics and Space Administration before publishing his first game, Mystic, independently in 2000. He has since worked with publishers Fantasy Flight, Flight Games, WizKids, Come On, and others. He's the recipient of the 2016 Diana Jones Award, and in March 2017, Eric became Kumon's director of game design. He left that position in September 2020 to focus on freelance work and activism in the board gaming industry. So now, Mer Mandy and Eric, we'd love for you to start things off with some storytelling. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. And I know that uh, this is being recorded. And I know not everybody wants to be on camera. Uh, I encourage it. I love seeing everyone's faces, everyone's smiling. And if you're not smiling, that's okay too. I'm a teacher, so I love to see faces, but I understand. Um, I know I see cameras coming out, that's why it makes me feel very nice that I can see your faces in this, in this world that we're in right now, but please, no pressure, okay? Uh, oh, Eric is with me. I'm gonna pop up as a teacher. Presentations, you know, try not to make it too presentation-y, but we wanted something a little light and fun for you. So 
discussing important topics, but this beautiful color. So let me see if we can share my screen. Uh, let's do that here. And by the way, Tanya, thank you very much for hosting this event. We're honored to be here and very excited to learn from uh, you all and your uh, and your presentations to come. I think everybody here is, uh, uh, will be delighted by how much they can take away from this. Absolutely. So I do have it up. Uh, I don't know if the reactions are turned on in this room, but I believe they're at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you can give me a thumbs up to let me know that you've seen, you can see the monitor, that would be fantastic. Yeah, I see lots of thumbs up. This makes me happy. Fantastic. Okay. Thank oh you. my God, baby, you're such a teacher. I love you. It's awesome. <laughs> Sorry, and I'm not pretending to be on a regular basis. Okay, I'll try not to be so chipper. <laughs> okay, so we'll get to get to the important stuff. So here we go. Keep up with Mandy and Eric. So thought we'd do something, you know, fun to talk about in this sense, but definitely we want to get to some important things as well. And we are going to make this more of a of a conversation. Um, we are uh, we're in a group right now with people who have multiple degrees who definitely know maybe a little no a lot more than I do on this topic, uh, but we're more than happy to share what we know in our context. So thank you all for being here. All right, Eric. So with that being said, well wow, that introduction uh, by Tanya was fantastic. I I don't know how much more we have to add here. Did you want to go well, first? We're going to yeah, to I'd like. I mean, so so we so many. I agreed to introduce each other, right? Because it's uh, it's a little unbecoming to talk about yourself, at least for, uh, uh, for me. Like, um, I've been in the industry for a long time. Um, uh, Mandy has uh, been in the industry for I think about ten years, right? Less, uh, that that sounds a, a little. Uh, yeah. Well, see that. It, <laughs> your, 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 your legacy is your legacy is bigger, right? <laughs> but so um, uh, because Mandy's too humble, I, I just want to sing her praises a little bit. So I remember that um, I told you I was going to embarrass you here. Uh, that um, so Mandy kind of stormed upon the the, the Canadian gaming scene uh, with a very very instantly infectious and recognizable uh, enthusiasm for every game she touched. One of the critical points about um, one of the critical elements of board game culture, of, role, of any tabletop game culture, um, is having enthusiastic ambassadors, people who are likely to reach out, teach other people how to play games, welcome them into their space, include them, and, and uh, help them, let, lead them to that magic moment, especially for newer gamers, when they get to play that game that helps them discover the, uh, the wide open vista of what this hobby can be. Uh, I've seen Mandy at conven many, many conventions do this time and time and time again. And it doesn't matter who you are, but, um, her, her, uh, her enthusiasm welcoming is unrestricted and unreserved, depending on uh, no matter who is sitting at the table. Um, I, uh, her and um, Mandy and Suzanne as being becoming members of, contributing members of the Dice Tower uh, was a major milestone in this industry uh, from my point of view, because uh, as we all know, the the vast majority of content creators in this space are are white male. They, they look uh, the way I like to put it is they look very very similar to uh, they're demographically very similar to Gary Gygax and and uh, Gary Gygax and David Arneson's game group, right? And it was so important, so important for um, for the furtherment of, of of diversity and inclusion to see two smart, intelligent knowledgeable and charismatic women on a channel talking uh, talking about games uh, without need for qualifier. Uh, it was absolutely landmark and I was so proud to see it. Uh, and I'm very proud to be sharing the stage with Mandy. All right, I'm done singing your praises. That was too long, I said short. <laughs> <laughs> so now I have to follow that up. <laughs> no, so, you don't, no, you don't, I'm making No, but, and, and Eric, I, it's funny, Eric and I didn't actually start talking until recent events. And you're saying, What's, what, what do we mean by recent events? I'm sure you all know the climate of what's happening in society is a little different than maybe 10 years ago, right? It changes. And Eric's been doing this for what, 22 years? You've been in the 22 industry? 22 years and counting, that's right. Yes, and, and you were always the person that you were the look up to designer. Everybody would say, oh yeah, he knows things, you know, he's been very successful. Nothing seemed to bother you. And I'm not saying that wasn't the case, but you just seemed so confident in what you were doing. And anytime I spoke to someone, they, they knew that you had the knowledge of gaming, just life in general. And I found, I find as of late, you've been really, really getting out there using 
that knowledge with gaming, but also talking about some of the social issues that are, you know, really coming up in the board game community. And I know you're trying to, I, I think I like the fact that you're taking steps to say, hey, I don't know everything. And you're putting that out there and we're, we're joining you in that journey. And I really appreciate that from you. So mine is not as long as yours and fabulous, but <laughs> I definitely think it's a journey that we all want to continue to take with you. And I continue to learn from you in our conversations that we have gaming or just life in general. So I appreciate you and thank you for being here with me today. Oh, we should also note we have our classes below. There's a reason for that. So I've decided I put my favorite class. Now, I, I should preface this presentation by saying I am not an expert in RPGs. I have played them. I use them in the classroom, but I am not an expert. Okay, so please bear that in mind when you're listening to me talk and say, no girl, that's not right. <laughs> okay, I try my best. So I generally tend to gravitate toward the mage wizard class. And I know there's a difference and that comes down to gender. I have a whole thing. That's, that's not what we're here to talk about right now, but that's generally where I fall. What about you, Eric? So I put, uh, 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 like Mandy, right, I'm, I am, uh, I want to preface this by saying I'm an old school RPGer. I actually started, uh, my, my hobby journey started uh, with Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, second edition, Spelljammer campaign, for those of you in the know. Um, that's right, that was my exposure to gaming. But that was my magic moment. That was, um, that was when, when I first entered the community. Uh, through a group of friends and learned about this magical untapped vista of gaming. Um, I, I made my class Monk Bard Mill. That's that is the first edition D and D uh, a, a bug in the uh, in the system where you could actually allow Mill to be a partial class. And I just thought it was I thought it was a nice identifier to sh to, uh, to remind everybody that I am an old school gamer. That is, um, I, I am adjacent to all of the amazing and uh, and amazing and inspiring developments in modern role playing but my perspective comes from the foundations of the genre that I grew up in. Perfect. So we're going to have different perspectives there but this is great to have this the differences. So let me swing on over here. Okay. Now we're going to get deep into some character backstory. So this is where you know I'm not going to just tell you a story. Yay, good times Mandy and then Eric's going to tell you a story. No. We want this to be conversation and please use uh, the chat if there's something, you know, you, you say, oh, this is, this sounds good. I can relate or I understand. Throw it in there. Okay. Because I can see it and Eric can see it and uh, we might draw that into what we're discussing. All right, Eric, what do you want to talk about first? Yeah. What do we want to talk? So, um, the, so as Mindy mentioned before, I want to be clear about this, right? Um, we, we're about, to, um, we're going to be followed by three amazing women that are, uh, that have, uh, that have done incredible deep research into the fields of diversity and inclusion. And uh, I actually look very much forward to learning from them. So we, so Mindy and I spent some time figuring like, how can we, like all of our knowledge comes from the street, comes from experience. Um, so we just wanted to tell a little bit of story about our background, like some of the stories from the old days, right? Um, so like, I'm look, uh, I'll start off, right? Um, I mean, I was, uh, I started working this industry uh, in 1996. I've been actually writing game designer on my tax return since 1998. Um, so, and for, this is uh, to, to give you an idea of, of how days of yore this is. Uh, when I was starting, there was no such thing as a career path for an independent freelance game designer. There was no, there were no, there were no formalized, there was no formalized game design education at that time. There were classes that were talking about gamification early, but very, very little of that was formal. Um, I was one of, I think, six people in the entire world that was making money uh, full time, uh, not that much, but <laughs> making money working freelance in, uh, in gaming. Uh, most of what I had to do was, uh, I, most of the, the, the gig work that I was doing was essentially um, I had sort of had to make up ad hoc on the fly. I'm telling you all this because I was also, unsurprisingly, the only black person in the industry that I knew of, right? And the funny thing is back then, I, it's something I didn't even notice, right? I, I was, um, uh, I am raised, I was raised uh, culturally white by German parents uh, in a very diverse neighborhood, but uh, my ancestry is German, my culture is German, my background, German is my native language. Um, I was, uh, I, I didn't learn, I didn't learn about what code switching meant until like four years ago, which was a revelation to me, which is, this is contextualizing uh, um, the story I'm about to tell you, right? So um, I literally realized looking back in hindsight 
that I basically spent 16 years of my career pretending I wasn't black, pretending I was just pretending I was a white guy, right? And um, and not overtly, right? But so, but but very subtly, and that um, which uh, makes the idea of systemic and institutional um, issues very very uh, very dear to me, right? Uh, I used to tell um, whenever I was hanging out with a bunch of my friends, I was. Uh, I, I would always, I mean, I speak like this, right? I speak very, very neutral Canadian uh, English. I have no accents. I have no, I never ever speak about black culture. I don't consider it. I, I made sure to even from time to time bring up, it's not my culture. I don't like rap. I don't watch black TV. I'm just one of you. Um, and the the key point here, one of the key points of the story right, is whenever I role played characters, uh, whenever I was designing characters for D&D &D or, um, or for uh, White Wolf, uh, World of Darkness at the time, my characters were always white and I was insistent on that. Sometimes, and I remember one very specific instance when uh, a friend of mine was making portraits of all our characters. You know, all of you probably have this in their group. There's somebody who's a great artist. They, they want to draw portraits of your characters to immortalize them. At one point, one of my beloved first D&D &D characters, somebody drew him as a black guy. And I was offended. I was actually offended. I was like, he's not, what do you mean? He's not black, he's normal, I said. I remember that to this day, right? I said, he's normal. Um, and it never, it didn't occur to me until recently just how encoded this, uh, this uh, cultural erasure was for me, right? Uh, as, um, well, a friend of mine told me like, hey, Eric, you kind of came out as black just a few years ago, um, basically saying like, yeah, I am black. Um, and uh, even though I spent, and I, and I want to make sure that it's very clear to everybody that I spent so much of my professional career, not in denial of that, but uh, making sure that that was not, that is not a defining characteristic of me. I'm a game designer. I'm not a black guy. Um, that I'm spending a lot of time and a lot of my efforts today sort of making up for that, making up for lost time, because that kind of erasure I can, I now see as as harmful as it was. Uh, maybe how about how about you? I mean, <laughs> you, you must. Wow, you must have like. I can't imagine what it was like for you, right, as a black it, woman coming into the space. It, oh boy, I understand what you're talking about. I mean, we live in Canada. I went to Catholic school. I'm Catholic. So you can imagine where I'm going with this story. Uh, my brothers, so I have two brothers. So uh, in school, generally, it was myself, my two brothers, maybe one or two other kids that were Black. You had a few people that were Asian. Do you know what I mean? It was such a small group. So I'm very used to being, and then I hope this isn't a stark term the way I'm going to say this, I'm very used to being around white people. So much like you, Eric, I grew up like, oh, well, my hair is not as straight. Maybe it needs to be that. So I'd straighten my hair, chemicals, all kinds of stuff in my hair. Do you know what I mean? Um, my best friend uh, is, is what? She's from Ireland. So let me tell you, she's more, and I'm going to use the term, she's more woke than I am, okay, to this day. But at the time growing up, right, I wanted to be like her. She's blonde. And, you know, that's what's pretty. I need to be like that. And uh, I think I got my awakening a little bit earlier uh, in university where I met more black women and I said wow this is I never you know I didn't date black guys I didn't I just had a totally outside of myself identity and you, have you heard the term oreo yeah. I have I have and I actually get in trouble for that so I don't say no, no, it anymore, but that's but, yeah. literally how I would describe myself and coming 100%. back and thinking about that I'm like that's that's not good that I would think of myself like this so, you know, I had to change that thinking over time. It's like, it's okay to be black. And, and even within that, I'm lighter skinned, right? And you're fair skinned as well, Eric. So we have our, a, a whole other subset of issues that we have to deal with, but coming to RPGs. And when I was doing that, I was the same as you. I wanted a character, right? That was lighter or had longer hair. And I had the same, literally the same thing as you where they made this, this image of me and it was like, it was black and I was like, but I'm not that, like I literally was like, but I'm not that dark, you know? Or I started nitpicking, like my nose is a little straighter than that. And I, I feel like people of color and I can't say all, but I do feel we generally all kind of go through this, hey, we don't match what is normal. And some of us go through that awakening a little earlier than others. But as a female that who is black coming into the industry, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's been something. I get interviews and 
they'll want to talk about me being female. Oh, what's it like to be female in the industry? And of course, you know, there are issues. I've, I've literally been to conventions with, and you all know Tom Vassell, and uh, Suzanne and I have been with Tom, and people have ignored us completely and just talked to Tom. I couldn't tell you, is it because they don't like us? Is it because he's the man in the situation? I don't know. But as soon as we have an interview that comes up and I'll say, okay, yeah, I'm a woman, but can we also talk about race? Because I mean, those are two things that are important. And for me, that's visible. And it quickly diverges back to, well, no, let's talk about women. I'm like, yeah, but me just being a woman in this space is one aspect of me. There's another part we have to consider. So it's... It's been hard and I feel as a female, I do tend to get a lot of pushback. Anybody who follows me on social media <laughs> will know this. So it's, 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 it's been hard. Oh my God, 100%. I, and I, I see it from the outside, right? Uh, looking at it. Do you remember, uh, do you remember when, do you remember uh, finding out uh, the moment where you found out that Mike Pondsmith, uh, who's the creator of Our Talsorian, when, when you found out he was black, that was huge. I felt so stupid that I did not know that he was black. And seriously, I didn't either. Yep. and I mean, you all don't have to admit it, you can if you want, but how many of you knew he was black? I did not know, and I was, it, mm. yeah. I'm not gonna lie to you, that, that, that one hit me right in the feels. Woo -wee. Uh, we, I remember, I remember, um, yeah, so I look. But, I, I like I said, I'm old school role playing, right? And I so what, one of some of my formative games were Mechton, Cyberpunk, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Castle Falkenstein. And I was like, I, I started noticing, like I'm sure, like you, Mandy, right? I started noticing the name on the box, like Mike Sponsor. I love this guy, and of course, I assumed he was white. Of course, I did, because right. like that's everybody is. And then I met him at a convention, right? And I don't know if you all know Mike Ponce, but he's a bard. Like his class yeah. is bard. I don't care what he says. <laughs> right? He is. He is an he is a, a delightful and articulate and concise speaker. And I saw him and I was like, oh my God, he's black. And I could like, and it didn't Did occur to me. Did you not just light I, up and go, oh, this is awesome? No, I was embarrassed, believe it or not. I was like, I, I didn't have the I didn't have the critical faculty that we have today, right? I was sure. just like, I was like, I, I I I like, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not proud to admit this. I'm like, I was like, what's like he's black? Oh. There's a, there's like like there's there's I, I had all the responses right i'm like yeah. like the the all, all the negative responses like not necessarily the racist responses but no. i had the negative responses right i'm like oh oh he's different right, right? and different that's right? always the word right. at least you right. didn't say exotic you know that that's right well i not that was this was my internal monologue right <laughs> right and like uh, i didn't have the oh my god he looks like me moment i was like oh he's different and it took me years until re to yeah. realize like just how deeply encoded that was in myself, Absolutely. right? And, um, and so, yeah, that was, a, that, it was incredible. And of course, and like Mike and I are friends now and uh, we, we talk about this, but the, the fact seeing him on that panel was so important and so pivotal to me, uh, which is why I, um, as the more we talk, uh, um, as the, the ladies after us are going to definitely expound oh. upon, it's so important to see people like you. Yeah, uh, in know, power absolutely. with platforms in a position of power. We we do have uh, some questions and comments, and thank you all for participating. I appreciate it. it. Makes it seem less about us, and it's a we experience. So I appreciate that very much. So Emily uh, has a question for us. Do you think you would have been as drawn to gaming had you identified more with Black culture growing up? This is a very good question, and I. Would you like to go first, Eric? Because I think even though we're uh, both black, we both have a, my parents are from the Caribbean. So we have yeah. a bit of a different background in that sense. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I'm so, um, it's, a, it's, I mean, it's an interesting theoretical. Um, and I, I've, I've never been asked this question before, no, by the way. So me neither. So, this is um, a great question. Uh, I love it. Um, so I'm going to be frank and say probably no, uh, because, um, because so much of the uh, what I believe is so much of how well I was accepted into the industry was that I blended in. I was one of the normal people. I talk like this. I present like this. Right. Um, and I, I, uh, I'm. Um, uh, what, what did uh, my my good friend uh, Amber told me? Like, like I am everybody's black best friend. Yeah, that was right? me. I, 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 I'm the safe <laughs> black best friend that you can have because I'm not because I spend so much time being non-threatening, not non -threatening. talking about any of these issues. Just being like one of the rest. If I was, 
uh, we all know, especially back 20 years ago, the space was, no, it was absolutely not friendly. I've been in spaces where I've seen black people. Yes, it's true, but they're always minorities and, and race always comes up, always, right? In the, in the, in the sort of passive aggressive uh, type way. So because I think I come from, my, my family is, I, I come from a mixed background, but my family is from the Caribbean and I come from a family of chess players. <laughs> So gaming has always been a thing in our community. Dominoes, anybody here play dominoes? Because if you've seen people from the islands play dominoes, bam, those things are getting slammed down on that table. It is a thing. Uh, so gaming has always been there for me. So I think if I had associations, which I did in university with people who grew up with parents from the Caribbean or from the islands, as we say, I definitely think it would have been. Now the types of games that I played may have been different or types of games that I gravitated toward because I do like a good dry Euro, but as we've all seen on the boxes of a Euro, what types of, you know, people and things do we see there? So, you know, that may have changed a little bit. So yes, I, I, that's a great question. And I, I think I would have identified, but maybe the types of games I played would have been a bit different. So thank uh, you. Maybe for that at question. the risk of, at the risk yes. of running over our time. Yes. Uh, There's a, yeah, I, we're going to keep it moving. But there's a comment. And then I want to I'd rather just... take more questions than move on to our next slide. If yeah, that's, okay that's, a, that's what I'm all about. Because the next one we can just kind of go through quickly so absolutely uh we have a comment from mark chen as an asian american i used to call myself banana or twinkie yellow on the outside white on the inside i totally feel mandy right now and i had a lot of friends who were asian uh growing up and same it's, i remember that and i would and it's funny because it never sat right with me but i didn't want to be telling someone that how to think because i was no better right in so. fact, one of my best friends and the founder of the first game company that I ran to publish Mystic, my first game, always referred to himself as a banana. Always. Yeah. It's like right? a preemptive uh, strike. I don't know. Right, right. And, and, and it bothered me. It did bother me, but I didn't yeah. know why. Isn't it funny? Somebody else doing it? Right bothered you more than you doing it and I don't know if it was just like you had just and and we have a comment here from uh, Car uh Caroline or Caroline I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name internalized dominance a hundred percent hundred percent yeah and I think that would be very accurate so right. see you all have this you all have this this wonderful advanced vocabulary which, I know which I'm right so great I'm so <laughs> grateful for right and Absolutely. it gives me hope for the future yeah we have a comment from Grace, um, and it's very similar. I was called banana. Mandy's experience is pretty much like mine, or coconut at times, depending on the time of the year. Wow, that I have to admit, coconut is not one that I've heard before. So that that's sadly I have. I had not heard that before. So, and I'm sorry that you had to go through that as well. And and hopefully now you know you're able to kind of look back on that and look now and say, hey, you know what? That I want to be better than that. I want to, I want to show my true self and be okay with that. So. No, I, I think that's, uh, thank you for sharing. This is, I should have said this from the start. This is a safe space. So please know that we appreciate this very much. Uh, we have a question from Derek about one year ago, Eric discussed similar issues with Tom Vassell of the Dice Tower, gaming in a social and political world. How have things changed since then? And what does progress look like? Uh, a lot more people are angrier with me than they used to be, uh, quite frankly. Um, and uh, and uh, look, uh, I, I'm a, I'm the son of my father uh, who had this formative conversation with me, right? Uh, and um, so what does progress look like? More of this, more on, more discomfort, more people like Mendy and myself speaking out, but more of it, right? We don't wanna be the, the, the token black people that talk about black issues. Um, so, and my, my dad told me at one point, I had a com formative conversation with my dad about this, right? And I told him, you know what? I'm getting a little bit more active about this. And he said, all right, just be careful he said to me, uh, be careful to, um, to protect yourself from all your enemies. And I, and I told him, I don't think I have any enemies. And he said, oh, are, are you really taking a stand then? And that really hit me, right? Um, I was like, and of course, that is historically true. It's historically and, and, and universally true. And what I mean by that, right? I'm not saying look for enemies, right? That's ridiculous. But uh, a lot more people are mad at me now, right? A lot more people cannot see... Uh, a lot more people see me as only a politic, uh, as as talking politics, right? And of course, this is politics. Uh, like gaming, all art forms are political. We'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, the uh, and uh, you know what? I I have 
the fact that more people are mad at me makes me feel like, I, you know what, I'm finally doing something right. I'm finally doing something that's actually moving the needle a little bit because more important than more people being mad at me, more and more and more people are telling me, oh my God, I'm so glad you're speaking up about this. I finally feel comfortable about talking about my background, about my challenges in this space. Um, and that, that moves me forward. Absolutely. And we have a comment from uh, Jason Perez, who I'm pretty sure I know. Hello, Jason. I just wanted to say that I got called coconut all of the time when I was growing up. I'm sorry. And honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that I actually have not heard this term before. So I'm, again, that's, that's, we, we want to, I'm glad everyone's sharing this because it makes it, and I don't, happy is not the word. It gives me comfort in knowing that I wasn't the only one. Because I Absolutely. always often thought it was just me because I was the only black friend. That's right. You know, so I, I, I appreciate you all sharing this. Do we have any more questions before we swing over to the next slide? We have a few minutes, but I know that um, Eric has a video that he wanted to see. And we have a, a quick little RPG-esque adjacent kind of slide we wanted to talk about. because That's why we're all here. So uh, if you have other questions, please pop them in there. Oh, and I think we did that one already. Okay, perfect. And we're gonna have more questions at the end. I think they're gonna be more for the, the other ladies on the panel, but please feel free to pop them in there for us as well. Is that okay with you, Eric, if we continue to- Absolutely, answer? please. Fantastic. Okay, so here, let me just close that off. Uh, we have a uh, video. Did you want to maybe uh, do a quick introduction here or how would you like to present this, Eric? So, yeah, so, so, um, Look, the, like the, the issues that we're talking about, we understand. Uh, we're probably speaking a lot to the converted here, um, but I wanna make sure that also, there are several people here that are listening that are coming here in good faith. They wanna learn more about, about diversity and inclusion. What does that mean, right? And um, we want to, um, I, the, 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 the ladies coming after us are far too modest, far too humble to talk about this, but the, there is a lot of, there's a lot of real world opposition to this and there's, uh, I'm sure you've heard terms like social justice warrior or uh, and and other terrible words. I'm not even going to say right, but um, there is there is a world. I found this video, which was brought to me by um, by somebody who said this is this is what you look like, and I was like, all right, but to me, it actually looks to me more like what a, a characterization of what this looks like, and this is what opposition to a movement like this looks like. And uh, please, content warning, this is ultimate cringe. But I would like you to know that there are like, like when, when we talk about, when we talk about issues of systemic and uh, systemic, um, uh, when we talk about issues that systemic and institutional, what we mean is the people, the, those who are in opposition to it are not lone people crying in a room. There are people, there are like content creators with millions of viewers, with budgets, with authority, with, um, a, a, a studio was paid lots of money to come up with this as the headline for an entire con against that, the, for an entire convention that was against social justice, uh, uh, social justice warriors. Uh, please watch with all the cringe and I apologize for how gross this is. So uh, I want you to look at it, have some thoughts and please share them in the chat afterward. Okay, so we're not, I don't think we have time for a super deep discussion, but I would really like to know uh, how you all feel after watching it, because I know I had feelings. <laughs> okay, so here we go. I think I have the sound on. Can you all hear it? Oops, sorry. One second here. If you've been offended, your feelings must be defended. Is a microaggression. Here comes Angela Frey. He's always ready to fight fascism with fascism. Starbucks windows don't stand a chance. Ethic enhancer. He's a systematic racism finder. Oh, I have the power to see racism everywhere. Using the powers of screaming and shame. They win every debate by calling your names. They're heroes who think that they're victims. Social justice Oh, God. Okay, Sorry. there's there's a lot to unpack there, <laughs> but just all I can say is, like, all. I am I am I am actually I am proud to have to have the people the people who would make this video. I'm proud to have those people angry at me. Yeah, but 
this this it, oh, i can't even talk i saw it and i just it's so silly it's and I, I you know i probably shouldn't be shaming but it's silly and i don't know how you would even argue that you just look at it and go okay I, it's, does anybody have thoughts on what they've just seen it even if it's something like oh, i don't see that, that big of a deal and i see there's some comments here i'm sure there are so Carolyn is saying, I, or Caroline, excuse me, is saying, I think I'm confused. My only thought process is what the hell? And I'm, that is exactly where I am with it. Look, why? The, the important context here, right, is that this isn't some YouTube guy who did it. This was the, this was the video that opened up a convention that was headlined by, uh, by popular YouTube content creators with millions of followers right? The people who are platformed on the news all the time. This is, it's not an isolated case. It's absolutely a, a institutional representation, which is why I thought it was important to show something like this. Right. And David says, straw man and projection. So what are your thoughts on that, Eric? Sure, sure. Uh, I try to avoid the, like, to me, like, obviously this is cringe, right? It's pure as cringe. But, but what's important to me here is that this is, um, this is how this is how the talk about diversity and inclusion is seen by a, by a non-trivial demographic, and that's some of the obstacles that we face. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. It's not like it's not like like deep to me debunking something like this is not the point. It is un recognizing that there's the, that recognizing the mindset that would that would take this in good faith as a representation of diverse, what diversity and inclusion looks like that is uh that is a big part of the struggle and, and jamie says this video uh infantilizes uh, minimizes valid concerns and beliefs in an attempt to discredit them it's gross and that's awesome that's a, a perfect <laughs> summary of that i agree uh and nicole says if this opens a convention then it shows exactly how deep the problem is Oh, Nicole, you're so right. Not only does it open the convention, I don't, I don't, look, I'm not going to name the convention because sure. I'm not giving, I'm not, I, I refuse to give them social clout, but luckily it's a, it's, a, it's a convention that was run by people who are on, who are regularly on mainstream news media. Yep. Absolutely. So we just wanted to, to, I mean, and this is, I, I'm sure the whole concept of this is not new to everybody. I guess for me, I'm always surprised. I don't even know why I'm surprised anymore of how people find new ways to make these sorts of thoughts, uh, you know, exciting for other people to say, ooh, that sounds fun and get involved. And then they're not actually thinking about what the message is. So right. Grace right. says this is worrying, especially the way that is, and this is exactly what I'm talking about, the way that it's presented with hints of anime. Having that float around online, having young kids look at this. I think of my nephew who's really into gaming and anime. And I could see this coming across, see him coming across this. And you're absolutely right because it looks, yeah, it's fun. How many times have you sang a song online about, you know, booty and shaking your butt and, you know, and yeah, the tune's really good. And you're like, oh, wait a second. What, what am I singing? Right? That's right. That's, that's right. what that does. So right. it's, it's a great, it's a great real time encapsulation of what institutional means. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mark? Chen says, when people learn that they've offended someone else and that they've benefited from structural oppression of others and have privileges that others don't, it's so jarring that their natural response is extreme defensiveness. But then they band together and validate their defensiveness rather than open and learn and listen. You know, the kids say are going to be all right. I would like, like, could you imagine even 10 years ago us having a discussion about this? I don't think we would have had these tools to discuss that. We would have been like gross, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe exactly. I'm just, I just want to bring to our yeah, attention. No, I'm, don't worry, are... Tanya and I are behind okay. the scenes. You're, you're good, don't worry. <laughs> okay. To, uh, so Derek says to me, it's usefully, oh, sorry, it's uh, useful only as something to make a privileged white person feel shame for a change. So and that's- Maybe. Thank you everybody for sharing your comments on that. We have one last slide and you know what? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it because we do need to get to the other people on this panel. It's not just about us, Eric. I know we're used to that, but you know, other people yeah, are absolutely. here too. I'm looking forward <laughs> to learning from them too. Me too, I'm so excited. Uh, so we had a little kind of 
this is something that I do in the classroom. So I used to teach children kindergarten through grade eight, grade seven and eight. Those are my favorites, actually. And uh, now I teach adults uh, in a federal government. So it's a totally different environment. And I used to work with the military. So anybody who is familiar with the military knows that it's a completely different culture. And uh, I'm always surprised at some of the things that I learned when uh, facilitating or teaching these groups. So often I will use elements of RPG, specifically character development. That was that was my jam. I loved it because I could get people to kind of pick a, a persona or something that was them, but amplified and that they could use in their, their kind of everyday job. So as I said before in an earlier slide, my uh, class that I like is uh, Maze Wizard. So we're just going to use this as a general uh, class for this quickly. So when you think of Mage Wizard, quickly in the chat, I have some things. Does anybody, what do you think of when you come to mind when someone's like, oh, you know, I like the Maze Wizard class. Just, I know we're, I'm doing this really fast because I, I know we're running short on time here. Uh, but quickly in the chat, what do you think of? I know- Fireball! Of <laughs> I, I mean, for me, teleportation's a thing. I do enjoy that. Now you're like, how does that skill help me in day-to-day -day life? I wish sometimes it could, but uh, not currently. Uh, what else? Yeah, because you're more hyper than me. Yes. But, so. Yeah. So, so, so Mindy's going to take this high brow. Why? Like, I look. I love massively multiplayer role playing games, right? So, I, I, I love reverting to my ten year old self. Fireball, lightning bolt, cone of cold. Do you remember all of you D and D players? Do you remember first, second edition D and D when you had to cast fireball <laughs> and you had to if you cast it in a closed room and end up folding back in on itself, dealing double damage and uh, and killing all your friends. This wait, is wait, not Nicole. the talk we're supposed to be having. I know. Nicole says dies of 1d4 damage. Dies of 1d4 damage. That's 100% right. Paper cut oh, could kill a level zero character. <laughs> Takes away all the bad things. Uh, invisibility and invulner uh, invulnerability, you know, summons creatures to fight. Effective healing and protection spells. Take time to learn our craft. And I, I, I see the future. It's very strange, but I, have a, I do have a psychic ability. Don't laugh. And it really is a true thing. That's a whole other topic of discussion. But I picked this role because these are things that I feel like, yeah, I, I could use these skills in a day to day life, or I think I do these things. Jamie says, magical skills earned through academics. Oh, Jamie, yes, yes. Bring in the highbrow. That is the best one so far, I'm so excited. Okay, so you get the idea of where I'm going. So what I generally do is have people have in mind, okay, this is my class. These are things associated with those class that I feel I embody. Right. I mean, and now keeping in mind, you know, I can't throw fireballs, but I can throw fireballs of knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that didn't work. Okay. <laughs> Zen says, uh, Mage Wizard, connection to the elements, amplified version of natural occurrences, harnessing chaos. Exactly. So these are things that I feel that I embody or that I try to do. They're good, good things, I think. Right. And I try to do this in my class, get people to, to start off with their character. This is where we're going to start. I haven't done anything yet. So coming into this, you're going to see lots of myself. No, I don't love myself. I just happen to have pictures that worked for this exercise. <laughs> so the first phase, oh, challenge. What's the point of learning about diversity and inclusion? Like most people kind of start off with that. Well, okay, what's the point of learning it? What do you think, Eric? What do you think the point is when people say something like this? Right. Well, so I mean, that, that question, it always, it always comes from a place of like, things are it comes from the the what i call the the, the moderate acceptance uh position right mm -hmm. like things are going great why are you introducing a new problem right um and uh and so i guess my answer is like we're not introducing a new problem we are shedding light on a problem you've always had and didn't see uh like right haven't you noticed that you're having you noticed that your gaming space that that for many not everybody but your gaming spaces gaming spaces, gaming groups tend to shrink over time, right? That's how it works. People move on, they get, uh, you know, but like, have you noticed that you, that your gaming experience tend to consolidate very often and, and together, right? You start to like get a little bit narrower and a little bit narrower and a little bit narrower and like, gosh, wouldn't I love to have a fresh new voice to, to bring some new life into this, right? Um, right, different backgrounds, different experiences are a big part of that, um, right? Uh, and I have this saying that I love, that, that I love, right? Where, where talent, talent and vision and skill is background and uh, demographic is, is background and uh, race agnostic, race gender, etc. Agnostic, but perspective is not. And perspective is so much a part of what we share when we're giving experience 
that you have to take background into account. So yes, it, absolutely, people with the same demographic background as you are going to have more of a baseline similar experience and less of a broad viewpoint to present. If we believe that, um, if we believe that um, uh, in social interaction as nutritional, then would you not want to have a more balanced diet? <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. And this is, this is the point of, a, in a class, I'd be like, uh, if I presented something like this. So this is the, I don't see color. There really isn't a problem. You know, that false sense of normalcy and comfort, you know? And then looking at your character, how do they address the challenge? And remember, this is you. Yes, it's a character, but I've asked it to be you, okay? Do changes need to be made? So we've started here. And you've told me all the things about, you know, your, your character that you feel you embody that, you, you know, yeah, I do these things. I can push these things forward in my everyday life. Now I've asked you this question. Can you still say that you're doing all of these things? Or do I now need to further develop my, my character after this discussion? Okay. We would go a little deeper into this, but for our purposes today, it's just to give you an idea. Next up. Ah, this is my favorite. What's in it for me? Right? And this is, if people don't get something you know, out of doing something generally, the drive to do it is minimal, right? And especially when you feel like you are not affected by it. So again, I ask you with the characters, uh, the characteristics you've now developed in your character, what's in it for me? How are you gonna explain that with the skills that you have? So Eric, I know you had chosen a slightly different class to explain and I think yours was, what was yours again you had? I, I'm Monk Bard Nil and I'm no good in this adventure, but that's okay, I can pick a new one. But look, I mean, <laughs> I, so this is where I, I, I definitely wanna bring my, my, my classical Please. RPG experience into this, right? <laughs> Yeah. Every, every gaming group is, a, is, is an adventure party, right? And come on, we all know. We all know a balanced adventure party is what you need. You don't need a table full of tanks. You don't need a table full of healers. You want a tank, a healer, and, uh, and a DPS. And even not just one DPS, you want all types of DPS. You want melee DPS, range, AOE DPS. You want all this stuff. Uh, don't get, see, maybe you got me started. But like the the... Like Tanya's like, like, come on, hurry up. I'm joking. <laughs> if, if, if the game industry, the game industry is the raid, the end game raid of social experiences, right? Like that's, that's when we culminate all of our skills and all of our skills and our experiences into furthering it and trying to spread our hobby uh, as wide as possible, right? Why on earth, why on earth do you like, like with a raid, with all the different challenges that's going to have with the, with, where the challenge is, we want to spread the hobby among as many people as possible. Why on earth do we not want somebody of every class? Right, right? absolutely. Every single class. Have you ever played a and game where everyone's the same class, wants to be the same class? Oh my goodness. Gross. Oh, right? wow. How far are gross. you getting? Ooh, four tanks. Nobody's gonna hurt us, but we're not gonna deal any damage. We're gonna run out of time, and then the raid mechanics get get us all killed, right? I'm but, only sorry. saying this because I have played RPGs where literally everybody wanted to be, and I'm like, we can't. We gotta. We have to branch out here a little bit. It was not particularly exciting. So, just uh, anybody else who wants to try. <laughs> we do have some comments here. So from uh, Caroline, if you were asking the question, "What's the point?" You were probably part of the privileged group. Exactly. Hundred percent, hundred percent. But yes, but unfortunately, it is a little bit our job to to shine a light on that, right? Because at right. some point, right, if they are part of the privileged group, then they're they're not seeing the problem. David says, "Funny how gamers understand groupthink when it comes to gameplay, but not when it comes to perspective." <laughs> Absolutely, David. I'm I'm borrowing this line the wherever you are. <laughs> kids are going to be all right. I apologize for assuming, <laughs> I assuming you're younger than me, but I'm pretty old school. <laughs> but it's very true. And it's funny, gamers do generally have, it's, you're so into this particular world and forget to see the outside, right? I do find that happens a lot. And I, I get it, but we, we forget. So another challenge we have, and this is going to be the last one here. I understand, but what about, not if I make mistakes, when? I make mistakes because everybody on here, myself included, we all make mistakes, even when talking about these sorts of topics where I'm, I'm in it, I'm right in it, but of course I'm gonna make mistakes. And this is the point in the discussion where I would have people, you're really gonna have to adjust your character at this point because some of the skills you know, that you had equipped from before, they're not, may, they're not, but may not be able to help you at this point. Now, do you need to kind of merge with a, you know, elements of another class? Maybe there's a race you have to incorporate that have certain things that you need. 
how are you going to do go better going forward? Because what you currently have equipped may not help you. And what does it take, of course? What, what, right? If you, want, if you need to do a skill adjustment and a, an equipment adjustment, you need time, right? right? All the classical RPGs, you need time. And you need what they call a rest period, right? That's, which is, of course, we're gamers. So of course, we're going to analogize here, right? But that rest period is, to me, analogous for what we call reflection, right? Um, you, need, you need that time to be actively reflecting and meditating. And it's tough, right? We're all sitting here slaying dragons every single day. And we don't know that what's different between games in real life, right? We don't know what every, there's, there's no prescribed series of encounters. There are no prescribed rest spaces. We have to take them. We have to mm -hmm. decide in the middle of the raid, fighting all the dragons, time for me to take a break, time for me to, uh, reflect, oh my God, I cast I cast the fireball in the middle of the room that was a little bit too small and I pulled it and hit my friends. What have right. I done? Right. I need to, right? I need to sit and reflect on the rules of the game so I know not to cast that fireball in that close space again. Yes, I got first, D, first issue D&D <laughs> back into this. I'm excited. Mic drop, <laughs> Eric out. <laughs> and that sums it up really well. And this is where I would talk about, you know, challenges of the class I had initially chosen. I'm, you know, not one to get involved in the big fights, right? But in this class that I specifically chose, but no, I need to be involved in that bigger fight. I have big ideas and it's great to have big ideas, but we really have to hone them and really focus on what matters. So these are things that I would have to work on as a class. How am I going to do that from our discussion? So I did this very quickly. This is an activity that I would do that would take a, a much longer time period and actually goes through the entire class. And at the end of the class, what is the character you started with and what, how did it end up? And then I get them to keep that because if we have continued sessions together, you're going to use that and apply it to any knowledge we're learning in new classes. So thank you for entertaining that. I know it was very fast, but if you want any more information about how else to use in the classroom, uh, you know, message me and we'll, we'll have all that contact information. Um, Mandy, not to interject, but there was a great button to that conversation that you had, right? Because the, the, that I just wanna make sure that you capture again, that sure. you end that class right, to use old old school RPGs, you are in that class and you're like, yes, I've gotten to level 10, <laughs> right? But the big reveal at the end of this is, sorry, this campaign goes to 50, yes. right? right. Yes. And so like, yeah, yes. you've learned the things, but now time to go to 50 and introduce you to all those new small rooms that your fireball's gonna hit your friends in again, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Let's See, start it again. And it takes more- it takes more, you know this, right? All of you, yeah. you know, every level takes a lot more experience than the last, right? That is, that game does, art follows life in this particular case. Uh, and I'm done. <laughs> so, and that's exactly right. Uh, we could go on talking about this as an educational tool, but I think you understand it from Eric's perspective and as mine. So hopefully that is something that you, you may decide to try and see if that works for you. So I think we've, the campaign continues as Eric uh, as, <laughs> saying and that's going to happen with our next presenters i apologize we're a little bit over time um but we're just so excited to talk to all of you and uh and for all your participation so the picture that you're seeing here uh <laughs> so these are my new dice i just wanted a, a way to show those off <laughs> from a canadian uh, designer so there you are and that's a solo rpg this is a new area that i'm delving into never played a solo rpg this one actually uses cards but uh well, I had to get the dice in there somehow. So there you go. <laughs> so now next we have a panel uh, followed by a Q&A with, I don't know how it shows up on your screen. They're all beside me, but some wonderful, uh, intelligent people. And again, thank you so much, everybody, for, for listening and being interactive with us. And we'll have contact information as well if your questions don't get answered here. Uh, the presentation that I have, if you want it, it is accessible. So there is alt uh, text. And I've made sure that if anybody needs that in a PDF format, I can send that to you as long as Eric is OK with that, because I think your picture is in there um, as sure, well. Sure, no problem. Thank you so much, everybody. We appreciate you. <laughs> Fireball. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Mandy and Eric. That was incredible. That was incredible. So before we d dive into the academic panel, I just want to quickly thank Game and Lab, an interdisciplinary initiative based in France that's focused on promoting research on games and gaming spaces. And they're sponsored by Asmodee and Innovation Factory, and they made today's event possible. We also want to thank Asmodee Canada for sponsoring this event and connecting all of us with all of you today. Uh, Asmo Day Canada is the leading distributor of tabletop games in Canada, together with Lion Rampart Imports, 
Acquired in 2019, Asmodee distributes over 12,000 product lines to 1,500 re uh, uh, customers throughout the country, including mass and specialty retailers, toy and generalist stores, as well as core hobby shops throughout the country. And I think you get most of my disposable income, so just a point on that. It's also our distinct pleasure to introduce as well our academic partners for this event. First, the digital, uh, the Center for Digital Humanities and its director, Dr. Jason Boyd. Thank you so much for your support and being here today. The Center for Digital Humanities, CDH at X University, engages in collaborative research at the critical intersection of the material and the digital, contributing to, to scholarly and societal knowledge about cultural objects, makers, and users. And personally, the CDH has been an invaluable meeting place and resource center for game scholars like myself and creators at X University and beyond. I also want to introduce Dr. Natalie Coulter, the director of the York University's Institute for Research on Digital Literacies, its IRDL. The IRDL has a broad interdisciplinary mandate to engage and facilitate in discussion, information sharing, systematic inquiry, and pedagogic in innovation related to digital technologies, medias, media and cultures as sites of formal and informal pedagogy and learning. So now we're your academic panel and we're going to explore some of the points and themes that Eric and Mandy have shared with us. And that was a wonderful discussion. And here's how it's going to work. I'm going to take a quick 10 minutes to kind of go through, give you a taste of some of my PhD research focused on the labor of games creation, the state of representation in ga gaming, and, and some direct perspectives from an online survey of gamers that I did. So with that, I'm just going to share my slides really fast. This is always my kryptonite when I teach. The handoff is always a little slow. There we go. Okay, and I'm sharing. Okay, so really quickly, um, I pulled together this research. My research is, uh, this is for my PhD dissertation, specifically on board games. Uh, one of the really fun ideas that, that Mandy came up with for this event is the, here's our character sheet. Uh, I'm Tanya, she, she there. Uh, my, my equipment that I'm carrying today is the delicious pie charts. And that's for Suzanne Sheldon. Um, hundreds of pages of survey data in a 250 page tome of tabletop wisdom, aka my PhD dissertation, that I put the pen down uh, in sort of early April. Uh, market research scryer and business whisperer. I have a, a de many decades long career in corporations, creating corporate dashboards for organizations. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about, just as Mandy touched on, is the idea that this is used everywhere. I used role playing in corporations. I used role playing for emergency and disaster uh, preparedness. But the wonderful thing about role playing is, and there are many affordances of role playing, it's a great place for creativity, for problem solving, for teamwork, uh, team building, small group dynamics. And it's also a terrific way to tell stories with each other, to have a, a, a common place, a problem to solve together. And that's the joy of games. Um, it also helps people like myself who have social anxiety and need some formalized rules to kind of work through a, a mutually identified problem. And it gives people space in, in much in the same way that Lisa Nakamura in 2000 talked about identity tourism in reference to cyberspace you can actually try on new identities develop yourself and so role playing have role playing games have an incredible power to make social cohesion and to teach critical learning skills but one of the really interesting things about games and gaming spaces as eric and mandy spoke to so well is it's not always a welcoming space, and I have personal experience with this, as well as a ton of research into this. So Fox and Tang 2016 did a, a, a study of people playing massive multiplayer games online, digital games. And what they found was there was a number of coping strategies that people used to make that gaming experience safer and better for them. And one of them was gaming with an ally. Uh, gaming with a, particularly a male friend was, it was a coping strategy that they used. They also masked their gender identity. 
And what this, uh, this statistic uh, tells us, um, it's actually 59%. This just came out this week, so it was quite timely. In PC Gamer magazine, Lenovo and a market research firm did a survey of women gamers online and found that 59% of them mask their gender just to be able to get through the game without harassment. And similarly, 77% of the women polled in massive multiplayer games said that they experience some kind of toxicity in that uh, game space. Okay, and the reason I raise this is role playing board games has a similar issue. And backing all the way up and looking at the demography of game designers, one of the things my research uncovered in my PhD dissertation, my, my contents are in peer review, is that uh, listed al alongside the 400 top ranked board game geek games, um, mostly were designed by white men. So at 92.6%. So that's, and again, it's multiple listings of designers. Many designers were responsible for multiple games on that list, but 92%, 92.6% were white men. And the reason I raise this is that the product, just as Mandy and Eric spoke to, um, your, your guild, your party, with a lack of diversity comes um, a lack of diversity in, the, in the, the game product. So here's some statistics. I did a very careful count of the top 200 board game geek ranked games and found that there was a real skew toward male identities at 76.8%. So I counted every human representation on the box. I also counted animals. So it's fauna and human representation. And what I found uh, was 23.2% were characters that presented as women. Okay, and then when I looked at race as a dimension in terms of this cover art analysis, 82.5% was white presenting and 17.5% were BIPOC presenting, so black indigenous person of color. And one of the dismaying findings from this research is you're more likely to see a creature that doesn't exist, so an alien, an orc, an imp, a dragon, than you will see a woman on a piece of cover art in this sample space, which is that top 200 board game geek rank games. So aliens and fantastic creatures are much more prevalent than images of women. And one of the things that was a, a great gift with this research was all of the stories that people shared with me. So I did a, a survey on board game geek, Reddit and Twitter um, that garnered 320 responses. I recruited for diversity. So I was looking for, so a little over half of the respondents were identified as women, a little over half identified as LGBTQ, and about 20% identified as black, uh, uh, black indigenous person of color, so BIPOC. And what I got back was hundreds of stories that people wanted to share with me um, possibly because of the frustration of the Likert scale. So as I was doing a psychometric me metric measure where they were asked strongly agree, strongly disagree with statements uh, along a continuum, a lot of people wrote in answers like this one. You know, it's incredible. This is a commenter for, from the survey. It's increasingly frustrating that when a topic of diversifying games or attempting to make them more racially sensitive, there's always a backlash of people claiming that we are being overly sensitive and the game is just being historically accurate. The most common response is usually along the lines of if you don't like XYZ in the game, don't play it. And the problem with that is instead of facing and trying to do something about the issue, it further alienates the player and is ultimately trying to get some sort of positive representation in the game. It feels like it's just another way of saying this game isn't for you, we don't want you in our game. So comments like that um, were, were very concerning to me. And again, sort of looking at it from a dashboard perspective around the health of the gaming industry, there's a number of alarming um, signals in the data. So one of them, uh, very predominantly, and this actually doesn't even count people who said they do not engage in online discussion of games full stop. One in three, however, evidence that they agreed or strongly agreed that when they engage with board game topics online, they have received online threats, insults, and or rude messages. And very similarly, in the role playing space, I got a lot of feedback about role playing in these many hundreds of written responses. Here's one from an anonymous survey participant uh, that sh they shared with me. It's hard to find alternatives for role playing games that aren't extreme aren't extremely racist 
as recent works have shown. I would love to play other systems, but they tend to get more expensive and they're a little harder to get into than this hugely established system. However, I think it's important to start actively looking for indie games made by BIPOC, LGBTQA folks, that more attention is given towards them. So a lot of comments in this similar vein. And one of the other really troubling findings that I, I found in the data was one in three said that before the pandemic, they avoided public uh, gaming events. And so that's a real concern, I think, for gaming spaces, gaming uh, publishers, and people in the industry. People are withdrawing, and uh, many short stories shared about why that is. A lot of feedback about the fact that they always go with an ally if they don't feel like they're going to be welcomed, and very similar coping strategies in 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 the online sphere um, gaming with an ally or um, and you can't do this in the role playing space so that's a big big problem you cannot mask your identity when you enter these spaces so i think that's a really important point and the other thing um, uh, another example of a comment that i got back was someone saying i absolutely love the hobby and my goal is to share it with as many people as possible so that it can be shared and represented with a more diverse group of people, I strongly dislike the toxic masculinity present in many communities and the sexualization of women that happens in games. I specifically do not play any role player Dungeons and Dragons types games because I am uh, because of the hypersexualization of women and the mass amount of respect disrespect in those sessions. So that's a lot of uh, a lot of comments in that similar vein. And, you know, on the darkest possible side of some of the data, one in three reported experiencing unwelcome sexual advances while participating in the board gaming hobby. So there's a lot of toxicity in gaming uh, and gaming spaces. And I think that that really diminishes what is a potentiality for a role playing game. It's a joyful thing. I was actually reading through a bunch of literature um, you know, over the last few weeks. And one of the things, there was a terrific book, The Postmodern Joy of RPGs, talking about the critical psychological affordances of role play, the sense of community, the sense of problem solving together. And if we don't make gaming and gaming spaces welcoming, open, eliminating some of the toxicity that is present in these spaces, we're actually cutting off massive amounts of our population from these, these opportunities for social cohesion, uh, for pride, for self-esteem, for um, psychological um, uh, de-stressing, because the world is very, very chaotic. Um, and if you don't have that sense of community, you do, don't feel excluded, RPGs can be the most vulnerable exposure of all, because you're actually, you're being playful, you're being vulnerable. And um, toxicity in RPG spaces specifically really cuts people off from that opportunity, again, for social cohesion, learning, obtaining critical 21st century skills, as Dr. Kishana Gray speaks about, that games provide you with that opportunity. So with that, I'm going to conclude. I have a little bit more to share in the question and answer period, but I'm going to hand things over to Dr. Sarah Stang. All right, thank you. I will just quickly share my uh, screen here. Okay, uh, thumbs up if you can see that, my title screen, perfect. All right, um, yeah, so thank you so much, Tanya. Um, and I wanna echo the others uh, in thanking you so much for all your hard work organizing this event. Um, and also thank you for inviting me to be part of, part of it. Uh, it's very exciting and it's been great so far. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, uh, I'm a feminist game scholar, uh, which basically means that my work analyzes games by focusing primarily on gender representation. So that's really the basic definition of what that means. Um, I recently received my PhD from the Communication and Culture Program at York University, uh, and I am also the editor in chief of Press Start, which is an academic journal um, that publishes graduate student research on games. So if any of you in the audience are grad students, and you want to get your game related work out there, uh, please check it out. <laughs> so thank you for letting me do that little plug. 
Um, okay, so my discussion of role playing games is specifically focusing on Dungeons and Dragons and role playing video games. Uh, but I want to emphasize that issues of representation and identification as they relate to inclusivity and sort of what we're discussing here today cut across all media. So when I talk about the importance of representation, although I am talking here specifically about the context of role playing, it's important to remember that representation matters in all media and in popular culture more broadly. Um, as Eric and Mandy discussed, representation is deeply meaningful and also political. Games are political whether people like it or not. If you can claim that games aren't political or that representation doesn't matter, or as was mentioned in the chat, if you can ask what's the point, that's probably because you are someone who sees yourself in games regularly and so you've never had any issues or moments of disconnect. Um, so I'll start with D&D. Uh, in a typical game of D&D, as most of you probably know, you have, as the player have a lot of options in terms of what kind of character you can create. So you might ask, in that case, why does representation matter in game content itself if players can choose to imagine and create characters that resemble them as much or as little as they want? Well, although these things really depend on how any given uh, campaign is run, the textual materials of D&D, so the rule books, the manuals, the modules, they include a lot of detail that sort of dictates the shape of the world uh, and the gameplay experience. Most importantly, they also have artwork, descriptions, flavor text, and statistics. These aspects more overtly dictate who gets to be the hero, what a hero looks like, what a hero's abilities are. Conversely, they also dictate who the villain or monster is and what they look like. And as was mentioned, and as you all likely know, D&D was created by Gary Gygax, who also wrote many of the modules and designed a lot of the characters and monsters himself. Gygax was heavily inspired by mythology, sword and sorcery fantasy, and Tolkien-esque fantasy, so unsurprisingly, this meant that the heroes in D&D were primarily envisioned as straight white men like Gygax and like the heroes from his sources of inspiration. Women were damsels in distress, trophies or rewards to be won, or they were sexy succubi, or they were hideous hags or they were evil goddesses like Lolf, the demon queen of spiders, who's been around since the early 1980s. More on her in a bit. Although there are mo now more artistic depictions of women and non-white men as heroes in the materials, many of the assumptions and tropes that Gygax established in the game remain. So you might have read about it, uh, but Wizards of the Coast recently apologized, kind of, for some racist elements in the game, particularly the portrayal of orcs, and, uh, orcs as savage, brutal, and less intelligent, and drow elves as evil and cruel. This is important because orcs have traditionally been depicted uh, using aspects that sort of clearly evoked a certain racialized groups, and the drow have dark skin. They never apologized for sexist aspects, though, which sort of rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, even though the drow are matriarchal and they actually worship Lolth, as a powerful dark-skinned goddess ruling a matriarchal society, Lolth is a very interesting character. But, of course, within the patriarchal worldview of Gygax and D&D, &D, a character like her must obviously be evil, cruel, and capricious. She's also a walking stereotype. She's only evil really because it's her way of getting vengeance against her husband who spurned her. That's in sort of the deep lore of the game. Um, and she's also like a bad goddess in that she primarily tortures and torments her own followers. And when she's in drow form, as you can see in this slide, she's highly sexualized. And otherwise she appears as either partially or fully a giant spider. So she's literally a black widow associated with a creature that is commonly viewed as deadly, sneaky, and disgusting, which all says a lot, right? This makes her monstrous hybrid in human. And that's worth repeating. This powerful black woman who has been in the game since pretty much its beginning and is one of the only portrayals of a black woman in the game is sexualized, monstrous, inhuman, and evil. Not a hero, a villain, a monster, the one who the heroes have to fight and kill. In their apology post, which has been widely critiqued for only happening in reaction to Black Lives Matter, yet another reactionary kind of thing, um, and also not actually doing enough to put actions to words, Wizards of the Coast said, 
quote, we want everyone to feel at home around the game table and to see positive reflections of themselves within our products. Human in D&D means everyone, not just fantasy versions of Northern Europeans, and the D&D community is now more diverse than it's ever been. Note how odd it is that they say human means everyone, but the issue was specifically with non-human races that work in the drow. And monsters, which overwhelmingly resemble humans in that they're humanoid or really just humans with like, I don't know, horns or wings or claws or something, are particularly juxtaposed with the human. So what does it mean when the reflection of yourself that you see while sitting around that game table is one of the monstrous or villainous characters who haven't gotten redemption or redesign like Molf? And what about video games? So D&D was the direct inspiration for the first text-based uh, digital role-playing games, and many contemporary games still use mechanics and aesthetics adapted from D&D. This is all connected, right? But even if a game isn't directly based on D&D, the same tropes appear over and over and over again through to recent games today. So let's talk a bit about a really popular exemplary single-player dark fantasy RPG, um, The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Uh, which hopefully you've heard of. So unsurprisingly, the hero in this game is this handsome straight white man. Uh, like pretty much every other video game protagonist, they're all kind of like interchangeable. <laughs> and unlike D&D, you don't get a choice regarding what sort of character you play. So you have to be this guy, Geralt, like it or not. There are powerful women in the game. So sorceresses who aren't just evil femme fatale stereotypes but you don't get to play with them, except in a few very, very brief segments. You get to either romance them or be their father figure. Actually, the vast number of women, the vast majority of women you encounter in this game in terms of sheer numbers are monsters. Harpies, sirens, succubi, female vampires, wraiths, water hags, grave hags, and crones. You, as this heroic monster slayer, kill these monstrous women, often in droves, and often after you invade their territory or hunt them down for rewards. You loot their corpses for their body parts, and you cut off their heads to attach to your saddle as a trophy that gives you, like, bonuses. So if you're a female player, let's say, hypothetically, and you don't really identify with this guy, you're left with characters you either sleep with, parent, or murder. Note how the human female characters are also white, slim, and conventionally attractive. Some of the female monsters are too, but for them that's just an illusion, uh, an illusion to lure, lure you in into a false sense of security. They're actually grotesque and horrifying in their true forms, which is of course when you fight them. The only ones, uh, monstrous women in the game, you can really spare are the succubi, who are female monsters who have sex with human men. <laughs> Coincidence? I think not. And let's take a closer look at those grave hags or those crones. So these are old women with sagging breasts, hunched backs, or fat bodies. How monstrous and horrifying, apparently. Oh, but they're evil, so, because of course they are, so that makes killing them okay, apparently. I hope no older women who themselves have sagging breasts or hunched backs play this game. But that's the wrong attitude. I do want old women to play video games. We should all want old women to play video games. That's wonderful. But where are they seeing themselves here, right? This goes beyond erasure and is arguably worse. Instead of being erased, they're there, but they're presented as horrific, hideous, evil, and worthy only of violent death. This is just from one specific game, but my research has demonstrated that these harmful tropes are ubiquitous in mainstream AAA video games. Like I had too many examples to fit in my work. And even if you can choose the gender of your avatar in a game, you're often still enacting this kind of masculinist violence against monstrous women. Um, and if you, if you are interested in reading more about this and seeing more examples, um, I have some work published, and this is also the topic of my dissertation, which will be published later this year. So a really important point here, uh, just to sort of wrap up, is that we know that in Canada and the UK, people who play video games are 50-50 men and women evenly split. Can't emphasize that enough. Um, in the US, that number is a bit lower, but it's still close to half. And yet these demographic statistics aren't really making change in the industry. They're not changing game developers' ideas of who gets to be the hero and who has to be the villain. 
the percentage of games featuring playable female protagonists presented at E3 in the, in the past five years has never been more than 10%. And games are still coming out all the time with questionable portrayals of female monstrosity, sexualized evil monstrous women who are defeated by heroic men. We keep telling the same stories ever since Perseus murdered Medusa and cut off her head in ancient Greek mythology. A big part of the problem is, of course, a lack of diversity in the industry itself. In terms of mainstream Western and video game developers, around 76% of them are straight, white, and male, self-identified. This is not a good thing, obviously. As Eric said, having more game makers from different backgrounds and with different identities means broader perspectives and more interesting games. Another problem is that, as Eric and Mandy both discussed, there's also a strong pushback against diversity initiatives and problems with a lack of inclusivity in fandom. But I'll leave that to Erica to talk about. So for those of us who make and write about and play RPGs, we need to ask, who is getting to tell these stories? Who is cast as the hero, the victim, the villain, the monster? In other words, what roles are we making people play and why? And I've talked a lot, so I'll stop there and I will pass it on to my fantastic colleague, Erica. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to, I have a very short PowerPoint, um, but I'm going to try to share my screen. So please bear with me as I swap over. Okay. I'm not even going to bother hiding the other slides. So I'll just sh switch over so you can see that much for now. I have very few slides, um, but um, first off, thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Sarah, for uh, sharing your research. Uh, I am currently a third year PhD student. I am in the process of getting my proposal greenlit. So I look very, I'm very excited to be joining uh, everyone on that journey of um, developing and contributing original research. But for my talk today, I am going to be drawing on my knowledge about uh, fan studies, um, and I'm segueing into uh, RPG and game spaces for this for this presentation through comics because uh, I am uh, I, I do comic studies, and so uh, with as with the two big two publishers, Marvel and DC have a lot of intellectual property, and RPG and video games are, uh, you know, they have a hand in that market as well. Uh, so. Like I said, thank you everyone for coming today and thank you um, to my wonderful colleagues and for Eric and Mandy for giving us a wonderful introduction and setup. Uh, so yeah, my research is in the areas of fan studies and comic studies, but as a general person who loves all things pop culture, um, RPGs and games are, 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 not, are not foreign to me. So when Tanya invited me to this panel, panel my first thought was uh, focus on RPGs and schemes inspired by comics. And so that is why I have um, Spider-Man, the PS4 game from 2018 on screen, uh, uh, Marvel's Avengers, which they did, a, I personally think they did a bad job of marketing this game because I did not know that the narrative campaign was, was centered around Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel, which is my favorite comic book character. Uh, I wrote my entire master's paper on her. Um, and of course, the more recent uh, Spider-Man, Miles Morales. And I think Miles has had a very big boom in the last couple of years, thanks to the Spider-Verse film. Um, but for my research, I focused on issues of representation in superhero comics. Uh, but more importantly, my, the larger question I focus on is why representation is so meaningful to fans, specifically if and why it, this is meaningful to, for uh, fans of, uh, of racialized uh, identities and at the intersections of race and gender uh, more specifically. Um, for now, I'll briefly sh I'm briefly going to share why representation to in fan spaces and game spaces are important and how this is related to a greater sense of community and participation, not just in areas of popular culture, but in larger areas of our greater social and cultural realities and landscapes. So, like I said, my wheelhouse is in comics and fan studies, um, but my first thought was through these three video games as you see on the screen. As a fan of comics, I knew I would probably enjoy enjoy these games, but also recognize that this was uh, for, the ex for the desire of an extended story. I came to comics at, uh, a little bit older. I didn't grow up with them. I read Japanese manga as a kid, but when I finally found my way to comics, it was like a scratch that could, I, I just wanted to keep digging and never end. And so now I have to recognize that, you know, these forms of intellectual tent poles 
um, are part of a larger transmedia for transmedia form of storytelling. So while it's not possible for me to generalize my experience as a fan for everyone else, um, as a fan of these comics uh, to game adaptations, it did get me thinking how, what are the overlaps between game spaces and fan spaces, uh, especially in, in, in how they provide people with an opportunity, opportunity to not only participate in, and engage with narratives, but also for opportunities of reflection on identity and uh, uh, self-reflection and uh, critical thinking. So in terms of representation, it got me thinking about uh, this quote from uh, cultural theorist Stuart Hall. Um, and I would like to share with you this, 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 one, this brief explanation he provided uh, about how one way representation can work. And that is, um, it is not that the material world which conveys meaning, it is the language system or whatever system we're using to represent our concepts. It is the social actors who use the conceptual systems of their culture and the linguistic and, the, and other representational systems to construct meaning and to make the world meaningful and to communicate about that world meaningfully to others. Uh, so <laughs> in some, or in other words, um, it's really up to how communities and how pe um, people in communities choose to use language systems or any other form of expression. So whether that's game design or uh, you know, designing, um, a comic book, uh, it, it's uh, to convey our ideas and values to one another and to, to the larger community. Creating meaning can rely, uh, can rely on how us as citizens, as community members, as fans even, to decide how values and ideas are expressed and used to create meaning in order to uh, connect to a larger world or to a, or to a specific niche fan community to generate something meaningful in our lives. I share this because it can help address how language, forms of expression, artistic expression even, and how knowledge especially are used to create spaces of inclusion and exclusion, especially when it comes to game spaces and fan spaces that tend to be formed um, around qualifications of gatekeeping whether it's on the basis of being a newcomer to an RPG scene or to a fandom or even to a new store to, to pick up your comics or to pick up the latest uh, game, uh, our experience in spaces and how values and ideas are communicated to us as valid or incorrect can leave a very significant impression upon us. And so for a moment, I would like to speak uh, personally from my own lived experiences. And that is, the first time I ever went into a video game store and later the very first time I ever went into a comic book store, I made sure to do my research before I took my first steps into that into those stores. I brushed up on the proper terminology, what the proper uh, word, uh, terms I should use if, in case in case I needed to ask a question. And I certainly practiced how the conversation would function, would play out. And if the conversation in, in real life did not go according to what I imagined in my mind, you best believe I would be riddled, uh, I would be frightened with anxiety and just hoping that the conversation would end quickly. But I, I did my best. I brushed up, I did research and I made sure to relax my voice so that when I went up to the counter to ask for help or even to check out, um, my voice would be lower so that they couldn't hear the anxiety and the nervousness, but also to, as a way to shrink myself. Um, uh, the, the comments Eric and um, uh, Mandy uh, shared with us earlier really uh, highlighted this process of self-reflection and self-growth in terms of reckon in terms of learning of our heritage and our identities but in this the reason i'm sharing this antidote is because even as a teenager i was i unconsciously recognized how how these game spaces and fan spaces were defined by forms of forms of specific knowledge performance and specifically along the lines of race and gender how these spaces were still very much um, defined by whiteness and masculinity when we consider how spaces are formed, especially how inclusive spaces are, are created, it often requires reflection and reevaluation of casual norms we take for granted. So I think increasingly a lot of people, both within fan spaces, game spaces, and, and industry, as it seems to be showing, people are starting to recognize that there are it's not it's not that they're discovering these problems for the first time, but I think people are now starting to open up to wanting to tackle these conversations of how does diversity and inclusion actually work in practice. Um, but it's not, but 
without understanding the deep roots behind where systemic forms of inequality and discrimination, whether it's racism or sexism or even forms of transphobia, um, it requires a lot of pause and it requires, a, um, it requires everyone to put in a collective effort in order for meaningful change to take hold. For many marginalized fans, it's not always 100% possible to escape into fandom or fan spaces or game spaces. Escapism is not equal. It's, it doesn't work the same for everyone. When the media we're, enga we're engaging with reflects troubling or even problematic representation, whether it's racist stereotypes or transphobia passed off as a sad punchline, uh, for BIPOC and, or que and queer fans, it's not possible to ignore these th things even in fan spaces. These forms of systemic discrimination uh, can be challenged you know, there is the possibility uh, of being challenged and, and, and questioned, but they can, these forms of dominant um, forms of oppression can also be replicated in fan spaces. It's why, you know, um, it's why backlash, there is backlash as um, our speakers today have so far illustrated time and time again. Um, there was a study done by Albert Fu back in 2015 uh, in which he studied fan reaction to the news regarding uh, regarding the idea of having a black Spider-Man. And it was split. There were some fans who were very thrilled and very happy, but his study also illustrated quite a lot of online vitriol and, uh, and harassment around the idea of, uh, I believe the actor Donald Glover at the time was potentially co uh, considered for the role of Miles Morales. And so that, his study was published in 2015 and has, he collected research uh, you know, a few years earlier. So within looking right now in our, in our current year of 2021, within about like a span of seven to eight years, we've seen how things can change. And I think that is reason for us to be hopeful. However, however we cannot let the bar remain there. Just because Miles Morales as a character um, is now not only profitable for Marvel, but also widely popular and, 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 and celebrated, it only means that there is more work to be done for us to be critical of the kinds of representation and the kinds of engagement we are having within our own communities. I do believe that there is tension and even within fandom uh, about what kind of knowledge and representation practices and engagement are considered valid or acceptable. I think if we are to consider one way of how to discuss inclusion, it is for us to reflect on what kind of practices practices, and what kind of knowledge are deemed as normal and start to unpack that. Especially when we consider how um, fan spaces and game spaces, these are not, they do not exist in isolation. They are part of larger communities, larger industries, and ultimately places where people come to not only enjoy themselves, but also, you know, Playing an RPG requires some vulnerabil vulnerability. It means sharing a part of yourself. And I think the last thing anyone needs is to be put down for be opening up and being honest. In other words, when we, consider, um, when we consider how fan spaces and game spaces are still very much defined um, by dominant structures um, of whiteness and masculinity, um, other forms of community spaces, we really need to remember that these things are connected to one another. And so being conscious of time, I will say, I will say this um, as a personal note to end this. My most recent form, uh, my recent development in my research is looking at the model minority stereotype. And I wanted to share this because um, in light of everyone sharing their experiences around words such as banana and um, coconut, um, as a teenager, as a tween, I, you know, I craved for language that could summarize my experiences and my identity coming from an immigrant family. My family is from Hong Kong um, and growing up, I was never just Canadian. The aunties and uncles in my life loved to wanted to very much remind me that I was also Chinese. And so looking at the model minority myth has been enabling me to further my language in discussing um, how internalized racism works both within personally and also within our uh, community, our racialized communities and heritages. And so I'm not gonna read the whole quote out here, but uh, to, 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 sum, to sum up, it's basically the model minority myth, there, there's a set of char positive characteristics and there's a set of negative characteristics. But ultimately this, this myth, this, this stereotype comes from a history connected back to the, the era of yellow peril stereotypes of, of, of the early, early 1900s. And so there, 
I think when we look at stereotypes and we look at how they are not just represented in media, in the things we consume, but also how we have, how we think about ourselves, I think it's, it's food for thought to pause and to reflect um, as Eric mentioned. And so everyone, thank you so much for coming and thank you. Erica, Dr. Stang, that was, that was amazing. And I'm, I'm actually just sharing some of the comments in the chat uh, with you both. Um, Sarah, you had, you had a lot of really interesting comments about Geralt, uh, or Geralt, I always mispronounce that. I do play the game. Um, did, you, did you wanna talk about some of those? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think someone mentioned that uh, he's not just white, um, he's also coincidentally the whitest in all the land because he's kind of he's kind of like albino. Um, I yeah, like I don't want to sort of categorize levels of whiteness in terms of like like appearance or whatever because uh, it's more it's more the fact that it's like a, a cultural identity marker here in this game that is very European based, set in this like fantasy version of Europe, and it's 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 an example of one of those one of those times where a lot of fan like when people sort of called for diversity, a lot of fans were like well, it's set in like medieval Europe. Therefore, there were only white people around. And I'm like, okay, okay. First of all, that's not true. Secondly, like there are elves and dwarves and shapeshifters and like monsters and succubi and sirens. Like, why are they all white? Like, why are they all white? If you can have elves and dwarves, can you not have people of color? Like, is this just like... So, so it's, it, it demonstrates this kind of, um, again, going back to these gatekeeping practices uh, in terms of representation, it's like, okay, we can have elves uh, who are also white and dwarves who are also white, um, but we can't have people of color because that would be unrealistic. Um, and you see this brought out again and again in fantasy and there's been a lot of pushback against it, but it just sort of demonstrates that it's not about realism or historical accuracy. It's about uh, protecting whiteness, right? Like it's about white, 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 white fragility it's about people who who want to continue to see themselves in these spaces because they've said this space is mine fantasy is mine it belongs to me and like if you want to mess with it if you want to heaven forbid have someone who is who doesn't look like me uh then then you're the enemy and i'm going to push you out of this space through all all means that i have and as erica talked about a lot of that happens within fandom like a lot of that conversation and exclusion happens within these communities where people just want to have a conversation they just want to say hey you know like what would be wrong with having you know a, a character who looks maybe not like every other one in every other piece of Tolkien-esque fantasy ever made ever um and so yeah it's 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 it sucks when it's a very reasonable thing to suggest and you get such like vitriol uh back in your face so people just say like oh it's pandering how is this not pandering to white people <laughs> I'm sorry what so yeah that's sort of my rant about Geralt <laughs> Anya, may I please follow up uh, just to re to really I because I, 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 I feel a very powerful need to accent uh, Sarah's point here uh, in the real world. So um, uh, I'll keep this short. This is a normally a 10 minute story, but the Reader's Digest version goes, uh, I designed a board game, a, a, a tile drafting board game called Ancestry for a company called, um, uh, uh, um, sorry, for Clypey Games, right, for a long time. It's, it's a family game where you draft tiles and it's about genealogies, right? Family genealogies, you put tiles down and you get married and you, and you have to spawn children, you, you score points, right? Simple game. Um, uh, Etc. I played test this game for about a year. And it was really, it, it was fun. Playtesters enjoyed it. It was great. Um, what I did, so in order to simulate the first version of that game, right, had marriages as uh, a man and a woman, right, one ring and another ring that stuck together. That was that was the historical representation. I didn't think anything of it, right. None of my playtesters brought it up. No, no worries. This was about seven years ago. Uh, I went to a convention uh, uh, in in Europe, and one fan. Uh, I noticed was very, very uncomfortable about it. Um, I, I thought they just didn't like the game, but they came up to me, they took, um, and this is why I want to bring this up. It's so important that um, the, the bravery of this person came up to me and said uh, that they felt excluded by my game uh, because, you, because why are you only representing one type of marriage, right? Um, and uh, I, of course, I, I definitely, I mean, I have LGBTQ friends everywhere, right? Like, like I live in Toronto. Uh, that I'm like, I was, I was defensive about it. I'm like, well, wait, of course, 
uh, but but historical, right? I had exactly the, what the, the, the perspective Sarah was talking about, but it bothered me. This person who didn't know me was obviously a fan of mine, right? Who was in a really difficult power dynamic, right? Who came up to me and brought this up to me. They did it for a reason. I'm like, well, all right, if that's, if that's, um, uh, if that's an issue, fine. The moral, the, the moral here, the point that I want to accentuate is I made a change to the game. I said, you know what? Never mind historical. We'll say, let's just, instead of making it, um, we'll just say, uh, love is love. We'll just make it two hearts. Any character that has a heart means they're capable of love and you can put them together. And that, um, so not only did that make the game more inclusive, it instantly, instantly made the game much better as a game, as a game. The combinatorics increased, the, the, the wilder, uh, family trees you could make the shapes were more interesting the stories you could tell were more interesting it had, it uh, emergently brought in like polygamy monogamy um uh, uh a romanticism because of the, they were put with no hearts just without saying anything about putting a button in it it made the game better and uh nobody including my most conservative friends ever came up to me and said i feel excluded by this game because you're including those others ever Right, the publisher of this game is a conservative, like uh, like almost stereotypical conservative white male. Right, said nothing. Said the game's better. I love it. So yeah, so sir, I just sorry about that, but I just want like your your point is very valid, and um, not only is it valid, like the reverse is true. Right, there's absolutely no reason not to be uh, to be defensive about it, and, and the but historical argument is bullshit. We're getting so many questions in the chat that I, I wanted to uh, we'll wrap up by answering some of these these terrific questions. Um, a comment from uh, uh, Kogut, I think, um, basically asking what can the members of the protected white male position, what could they do as organically as possible to bring more diversity to to this space? So in terms of of you know, to, to equally protected white male, um, what can what can wh white men do to make this space more inclusive? And I think, you know, er Eric and I, Erica and I had been talking about this as we were planning for the panel. And it was a really, really interesting point that she made about the, the idea of the mainstream. And then what happens in, in communities. One of the things I got back from my research in doing these surveys was a lot of people um, have to curate their game groups very carefully. Um, in fact, you know, I can't go into the qualitative interviews because they're still going through peer review, but there was a lot of discussion about carefully curating um, bubbles. And I, this is Erica's term, you know, bubbles, pockets of safety, especially with RBGs, because it is a very vulnerable position to be in. And they couldn't enter the mainstream. And this is, I'm, Erica, I'm, I'm speaking for you here. I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about that a bit more in terms of, you know, not not being able to feel like you're in the mainstream and that mainstream space is a preserve of middle class white males, middle class straight white males. Yeah, no, thank you. I can totally I can try my best to speak to work about that. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of marginalized fans when they when people make their first entry into into whether it's game, game spaces or RPG spaces is to you know find commonalities with fellow players Pe because after a certain point cross identification this this process of like can i relate to this character who is who is not similar to me whatsoever like we may have we come from different lived experiences but can i try to find commonalities after a certain part point in time it becomes a very exhausting it, it requires emotional labor and so you try to find fellow peers who can support you and understand so that there isn't always this constant process of explaining this is the perspective i'm coming from you know bear with me as i learn to fit in but if we're talking about how do we make in spaces in inclusive it requires like not requires this dismantlement of what is considered acceptable knowledge and acceptable practices. And so if we're asking how can people be better allies or you know, how can me white men in positions of decision-making and power make changes, it's as simple as, I don't wanna say as simple, but I think sometimes you underestimate truly how much power <laughs> is, in, is encapsulated in that. And that is, if you just speak up, like that is disruptive, that can be disruptive. In, in, in just um, holding peers or colleagues accountable and say, I don't 
this doesn't hold up. This doesn't make much sense because that that is one step to opening a larger conversation in in getting this the ball rolling on how do we continue, not just hold ourselves accountable, but how can we actually start reflecting on the structural infrastructure in our spaces so whether that's gameplay whether that's the culture or whether that's a sim- or the way we speak to one another like the most pervasive forms of of discrimination is the casual passive aggressive microaggressions that exist so i think if you holding our own friends and peers accountable by saying what you just said right now is um it's not good we we gotta we gotta t- we gotta look into that uh, or consider if there's a better way of communicating and and that that is again i to me, in, at this point, it, that is very low, and the bar needs to keep moving in order to make actual collective meaningful change. That was amazing. You know, Zen actually has a really good question, and it really speaks to stuff that Erica has talked about and Sarah has talked about in terms of the recursive nature of game design. And we we have these sort of well worn uh, path pathways in our brains about you know as Zen identifies the the high fantasy kind of European Renaissance and 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 the fact that there's always almost the Joseph Campbell monomyth a white man alone uh, the hero claiming his prize of of the damsel in distress um, and that this is a really recursive problem we have because all of the, we're enculturated to to tell these stories over and over and over again um, and also there's a publishing issue. Um, with derivative and recursive themes because of risk, f- fear of risk. And I wonder if, if Eric could start and then Sarah could pick it up. A great question from Zen, just about the, the notion of high fantasy and you know, Renaissance themes, and we've seen them and we keep seeing them, and it's a really good point. I'm very sorry, Tanya, because I cut out my audio halfway through the question. I'm sorry, can you please restate it? Not, not to worry, Zen raises a real, and Zen is actually a fantastic game designer herself. Uh, she attended one of our workshops at X University and she's fabulous. Um, but Zen had a great question about high fantasy and sort of the, the recursive kind of derivative nature of the way that we tell these stories, that we have these sort of well-worn pathways in our brains about, you know, the high fantasy hero alone who claims his prize, often, uh, you know, a woman who's meant to just stay still and be pretty. Um, and you know, how do we get out of that? How do we we change the way that we're we're telling these stories? Who oh boy. Um, uh, look, I'm gonna give you an answer that's um, that that was probably going to be popular in this room, but it's not going to be popular in the outside world, right? Um, but it's it, it starts with the creator. It always does, right? Um, you, so when we talk about well-worn pathways, it's true. Well, there are well-worn pathways for a particular demographic, right? For the demographic that has a uh, that that was brought up with those stories, and because they were brought up, they were uh, due to exposure to like-minded people with that. Um, look, uh, I'm going to give you a slightly analogous point here. Um, um, I made a conscious effort in the last uh, three years to stop, um, not to stop, but to to spend more time working with specifically seeking out other designers, other creators, specifically from marginalized spaces, right? They're harder to find because they're not always welcome in our space, right? There's a lot of obstacles. I had to go really put in the effort to find them, but the rewards have been amazing, amazing, right? Those well-worn pathways of which you speak don't exist. They have other stories. I've never heard these stories. Amazing, right? Um, With deep, varied, interesting characters, new villains, new paradigms. Um, Shakespeare is right, there are only seven types of stories, but gosh, there are so many different types of people that can, that, that can populate these stories, right? So start at the creator level, invite new creators into the space, step aside, make some space for them. Um, I've been relentlessly um, supporting and trying to, uh, and trying to highlight uh, other create, uh, creators from marginalized spaces specifically for that reason. Right, um, not not to say like, oh, look at me, I'm a great helper, but because it's the responsibility of people like me with a platform to provide that kind of space. Um, th- that everything else trickles down from there, right? But to my mind, start with the like, start with the like, literally forcing, not forcing the people, not forcing people into the space, forcing the doors open, so that um, so that other people can find the space and feel comfortable in that space. 
and then we can solve tactical problems later. That's amazing. We have 10 minutes left. Um, so I just wanted to take a quick moment just to thank uh, some of this event today. Uh, and thanks so much, everyone, for your great discussions and all your hard work as we pulled this together. I wanted to thank again Game and Lab, Asthma Day Canada, the Center for Digital Humanities, the IRDL team, Dr. Boyd, Dr. Coulter, uh, Reginald Beatty. Thank you all so much. And thank you to uh, Misha Ruiz and uh, Gabrielle Faust and Emily Bradshaw, uh, Melanie Wattier, uh, Leah Martinez, and all of the others that pulled this event together. Thank you so much for all your hard work. We, we, got, we got a torrent of questions. Um, but I think this is uh, this was a really amazing discussion, and I, I wonder, you know, Mandy, Eric, do you have any final words that you'd like to share? Or I, I'm thank thank you everybody for for joining us today. That's the first thing. I mean, this is a topic that I feel like people, some people, are like you're beating us over the head with this. We get it, we get it. Well, obviously, we don't get it because we're here talking about it, right? And I feel like sometimes we have to find creative ways, uh, and it's it's not up to us, right, solely to make those creative ways for people to learn about the topics that we're talking about today. I think I have to do a better job. And this is one of those things where we talked about challenges, right? I try my best on social media to promote uh, some of the things we're talking about, promote people who are trying to break into the industry, you know, who are not white males. And I have to do a better job of making myself a bit more well known with those groups. I try, but I could do better. And I think that's one of those things that we can all do something a little bit better. Not just everybody else has to do better. We also maybe need to do that as well. So just sitting here, I've learned quite a bit uh, from the panel and I'm sitting back here with my screen of going, yes, yes, yes. Like it's so nice to hear that I am not the only one thinking that, right? And it's being said in a different way, but it's the same message. So thank you. I appreciate that. And, and, and reach out. If any of you have questions for me, I'm on social media all the time. If there's something in the presentation, um, as I said, I'm a teacher. So if there's something that you liked and you want to implement, let me know. And I will create maybe an easier to read template that you can use going forward. Thank you. I thought that game was brilliant. I think that is such a, a great, great classroom exercise and can really deepen empathy. It's, it's, I think it's brilliant. And thank you so much for that, Mandy. Thank you, Eric and Mandy. This was fantastic. Uh, and I've, I've held it together because I am such a, uh, I'm such a, uh, such a fan. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm proud of myself. I kept fairly cool, uh, you know, uh, speaking to you both because I'm huge, huge, huge fan. The, uh, I, I met Eric Lang uh, several years ago and all I could do is, is stare at him like SpongeBob describing Christmas uh, at an event. And we were too scared to, to come up, my partner and I. So thank you uh, for all your, your great work. And thanks to Erica and Dr. Stang for their fantastic presentations. If there are any other questions, I think we're good. I, I'm seeing just nice comments in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. This is a, a part of history, a uh, part of role-playing history. So I'm very pleased and proud that, uh, that we could be a part of it. And thanks for the great questions and discussions. I wanna say the same thing right back at you, uh, Tanya. Thank you for your talk and your, sharing your research and all of your hard work. You were, you were awesome, so clap for you too. <laughs> yeah, if it wasn't for Tanya, um you know, reaching out and do, she's done so much work. You, you have no idea how much behind the scenes uh, time and effort and labor she's put into it um, and how she's made so many amazing connections. So hats off to Tanya. Thank you for putting this together uh, and connecting everyone together. So yeah, the plus, plus 10, right? Like, but, but so there, but there's a larger point to be taken from this, right? Um, which I want to bring up. Um, I, I've seen one of the more subversive not sub, sorry, sorry um, pernicious, one of the more per, sub pernicious kind of narratives that I've seen enter the, the, the discourse lately is, right, you, you, we all know about the like, ah, oh, I don't like, we know about the extreme ends, like, I don't care about diversity, ah, oh, it's all political, we know about that, right, that, that, that's well-worn ground. But this sort of, the, this, this, there's this undercurrent of, uh, well, we have it better off today than we've ever had before. Well, things just get better, right? That pernicious, that, that, that's a pernicious for specifically because um, it's so easy to forget, right? That every inch, every square inch of progress that's ever made is made by the, the countless, un, uh, the countless hours and countless endlessly opposed work 
done by people like you, Tanya, like you, Sarah, like you, Erica, right? And Mandy and I are good spokespeople for it, right? But we're kind of the, we're just, we're the faces of it, right? Uh, like, I want to make sure we know, we see you, we see the work you're doing. You, it's, and we know how unbelievably opposed you are. There's no such thing as progress without blood, sweat, and tears. And I want to make sure that it's very, very clear to everybody in this room that uh, like this, what you're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. You're not seeing the hundreds of hours that have gone into this. Um, so please like, like take our thanks and I'm honored to share the stage with you. I think you, you are all amazing. Thank you all so much for, for being here today. Thank you. And uh, you know we're reachable on Twitter, and uh, if uh, and 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 just just please do follow up. Um, I'm at at Pobeda Tanya. It's my first and last name on Twitter. So connect with me if you if you would like. And uh, and I know we're all very open to uh, to dialogue. So thanks so much. Thanks so much, Tanya. Thank you. Thank, thank you, so everybody. Much. Thank you, everybody. Eric and Mandy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Mandy thank and so Eric. Much. It's wonderful thank sharing you. this this space with you. No, oh, all of you and uh, Erica and the rest of the crew, if you don't mind just hanging back just a, uh, for a moment. Thank you so much.